Hello and welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal humans, and we do this one topic at a time. We are me, Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer in God, and Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and atheist. Jeff? How do you do? We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, we have a discussion, which is what we're doing now, and then we publish the notes, which are available on our website, eclecticist.co.uk. That's eclecticist.co.uk. And we do this to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing in this episode is watches. Wristwatches. A watch is a general term for a small wearable clock. After centuries of admirably telling the time of day, they soon expanded into various other time-based arenas, such as informing its owner of the day of the week, the month, moon phases, an alarm, and even a stopwatch. In the 1970s, the humble watch jumped on the digital bandwagon and went stratospheric. The clock face gone. Instead, an array of futuristic numbers that dance and sparkle, and even more time-themed features. Soon, a calculator of all things. Through the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, watches got better and better, and just when we thought we had a fully developed understanding of the watch, bam, the smartwatch happened. This is all well and good, but let's not forget, a watch is wearable. That is to say, it can be clothing or jewelry. Not only can it tell you the time, it can tell you that the person wearing it has good taste or should be killed. We're not going to be talking about flying aids. So compasses, although they can be built into watches, is not going to be the central topic of discussion. Um, uh, I think we simply have to start with history here. So, of course, we're talking about watches, but we're talking about contemporary the contemporary meaning of watches, oh, a watch, which is a wrist watch, basically. This is a, a small clock that you wear on your wrist and usually on the upper side of your wrist, although ergonomically I think it would be better the other way around, but we'll have that conversation. So historically, I just had a, you know, I spent it, obviously we spent a very small amount of time researching our topics. And really this is just uh, to learn a little something for ourselves on the topics that we choose to discuss uh, and just looking quickly at the history of time and timekeeping or horology, um, it's it's vast. It's such an unbelievably huge topic that we couldn't possibly hope to even scratch the surface. But looking at the history, it would seem that the first ever wearable clock was invented, or rather it was gifted in 1571 by Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. And evidently he, or his people, presented Queen Elizabeth I with an arm watch, which is an amazing timekeeping device, which is made even more amazing because you can actually wear it. Um, And uh, there's uh, a little bit of text here. Uh, In the closing thereof a clock, and in the forepart of the same a fair lozenge diamond without a foil, hanging thereat a round jewel fully garnished with diamonds and a pearl pendant. So it was a a real slice of cheese that was being presented to the queen, which was, you know, that's the way it was. Everybody always handed something uh, that was particularly interesting and coated in jewels to the ruling monarch, lest they lose their heads. Uh, So 1571, you could say, was the first ever wristwatch (laughs) worn by a real person. So 1571, that's a very long time ago. Uh, 1656, the, uh, this, uh, Dutch physicist, I believe, maybe a chemist, Christian Huygens, he made the first pendulum clock. So that was a big invention. A, A pendulum is an amazing thing that swings back and forth very constantly and very predictably. A bit like you. Yeah, and I I think it swings the same regardless of the weight. So if you have a 
the length of the pendulum, it's irrelevant what the actual weight is. The weight can change, but the pendulum remains the same. It's, it's bizarre, but this is a real discovery. And of course, it allows you to build a timekeeping device. Anything that's regular or oscillates, um, you, can, uh, you can keep time with it. Escapement. Yes, the escapement, indeed, which is uh, how the, the regulation of whatever the power source is into, you know, periods, predictable periods of time. Uh, 1830-ish, uh, Blondo makes the first mechanical digital watch. So this is a mechanical watch, uh, but it has numbers, you know, that are actually moving rather than uh, arms sweeping around the face or actual digits. Uh, and that was 1830. 1880, this is the first quartz clock. Uh, 1969, Seiko, I believe it is pronounced, uh, Japanese watch manufacturer, brought out the first quartz wristwatch called the Astron in 1969. And 1972, the first non-mechanical digital watch came out, which is a purely digital, digital, electronic digital watch, as we are familiar with now. That had uh, LED numerals on the face. That was 1972. And then from there, as you say, you know, an explosion and every possible conceivable type of wristwatch happened. But um, that's the very basic history that I could find on wristwatches. And I think there's no real discovery in the wearable aspect of a watch. I mean, a watch is a clock. And if you can make a clock small enough, well, then you might want to attach it to yourself uh, with some sort of band, perhaps. So I don't think anybody could possibly pinpoint when the first true wristwatch happened, because, you know, it seems like a fairly obvious idea to strap a very small timepiece to you, especially if you're a sailor or, you know, <laughs> whatever it is you're doing, it's great to free a hand up. So, you know, the, the discovery of affixing something to your body and the discovery of a clock, I don't think necessarily need to be related. We should say that the Hamilton watch is the Pulsar watch, which I think people will be more familiar with, which is the, the famous red LED watch from the early 1970s. Yes, yeah, the, indeed. The Hamilton, Hamilton Watch Company built, uh, they had a, a model of watch called the Pulsar, which I think Seiko subsequently purchased. I think they purchased that model line or that brand, Pulsar. And the first digital watch, um, you know, it was really expensive. It was like thousands of dollars. Uh, and it was a solid gold case that it came in, you know, <laughs> proper gold case. And it was LEDs. Uh, you had to push a button to see what the time is. So that foreshadowed, I think, some of the smartwatches that we're seeing now quite closely. Yeah, I remember they brought those back about 10 years ago. There was this real kind of um, retro kick and uh, I remember thinking just how impractical these things are. And now here we are with uh, Apple saying, no, they're not impractical. You're impractical. <laughs> Indeed, with the smartwatches, which, uh, which we'll get to. Just to, to finish off the little bit of history that I was reading, um, time and timekeeping, which is horology and the measure, measurement of time, uh, you know, it goes back since the dawn of time. Uh, no pun intended, with uh, all kinds of ways of tracking the stars and watching the moon and watching the sun and all the rest of it to try and mark off the days to our inevitable deaths. But uh, it was Galileo Galilei, uh, that guy, he was just so ridiculously talented. Um, he invented timekeeping pretty much by uh, by watching that the swing of the pendulum. You know, it, it occurred to him that uh, it takes the same time to swing a pendulum uh, if the length is the same, regardless of the weight. And it's just, what an amazing observation that was. But uh, that was the basis for timekeeping. Just that observation, you know, with gravity. Uh, incredible. So that, that's where it all comes from. Did you ever go and see the time exhibit at the Science Museum in London? Yes, they have a whole watch gallery there. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. It's kind of tucked away into a little corner, but they have a whole bunch of um, various pieces of uh, clock history, like uh, parts of the original atomic clock and um, all sorts of other you know experimental time pieces. But they have this really fascinating 
se- selection of wristwatches, you know, throughout the ages. And what's sort of conspicuous up until relatively recently is just the girth of the damned things. They were just massive, just huge, big hamburger watches. And then they all shrunk. Yeah, throughout the 80s and the 90s, um, and even up until the early noughties, perhaps, watches really went really quite small indeed. And most of all of my watches are very small. I mean, my very most recent watch that I have at the moment, which I bought in the last couple of years, is right back up there in the big chunky town of uh, 42 plus size. Um but yeah, they went through a time when they were really laughably small to my eyes now. Very, very much like mobile phones. Mobile phones went smaller and smaller. Well, they started off huge and gradually went smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and then went huge again with because of various types of technology and changes in usage and whatnot. But it's, it's interesting to see because, of course, this always has a bearing on aesthetics. And, uh, you know, people... And, and if, if anything's aesthetic... It's certainly wristwatches, which are absolutely jewelry, uh, because you're wearing them. <laughs> if you're wearing something, you know you're gonna wait, you you want to make it look nice, uh, unless you don't. But uh, you know that's another aesthetic consideration. Um, I've seen a lot of brutalist watches out there on hairy wrist wristed people. Um, but uh, yeah, they're jewelry for sure, and the sizes have been fluctuating. But I think uh, there are limits, and uh, I think at the moment it's about visibility. So, Jeff, why don't you tell us your story? For many years, you were very kind of anti-watch and would um, rant at anyone who had a watch uh, that they are an idiot and they're wasting their lives. But in the last year or so, you have now joined us. You now have a wristwatch. Sure. Yeah. Accepting everything you've just said, uh, I used to really be into watches and uh, I've had many, many watches uh, ever since I was a, a kid. I've been fascinated with the technology, and I've certainly been fascinated with technological watches. So although I never actually had a calculator watch, I had every other type of digital watch, including voice-activated watches. Um, I had a voice-activated citizen watch in the 90s, uh, which was amazing. Jeff, nope, you did have a calculator watch, and I remember it very distinctly. It uh, it was a black Casio watch with red buttons up both sides. I don't ever remember owning a calculator watch, but then my memory is poor. No, you definitely... Um, you, you definitely did. But I don't mean to embarrass you uh, in, about you not remembering. I'm just trying to jog your memory um, just so you may talk about it. Because I remember thinking it was kind of cool. And it was shortly before I got my first calculator watch. Okay. Well, I, I simply don't recall. Um, but I, well, there you go. I've had lots and lots of technological watches and lots of sort of um, address watches as well. And I think they're fascinating because even though they're a fairly uniform size and that they don't really extend beyond the size of your wrist they're amazingly variable you know there's so many millions of different styles uh, and lots of different features that uh, they are quite interesting because it's very rare when you see two people wearing the same watch Uh, that's the sort of phenomenon that probably happened right at the very beginning of wristwatches and is now happening with the uh, the individuality of apple watches uh, where they are all identical except with slightly different types of metal uh, uh, surrounds. But yeah, so I I was really into watches for a very long time and then just sort of saw a photograph of myself wearing a watch. And I just thought, wow, that looks really clunky and dopey. Uh, I'm just going to stop wearing a watch because I have a phone which has a clock on it. So for a good 10 years, I didn't wear a watch at all uh, and never had a problem. Then suddenly, I had a need to actually have a stopwatch. I needed a stopwatch that was really quick and easy to use and was instantly available. And on a mobile phone, it's not instant. You you have to unlock the phone. You have to open up the app and then you have to tap a few buttons and it's not instant. Um, Whereas uh, having a watch, you have a stopwatch, simple. It's very practical. And that's the reason why I wear a watch. And uh, I enjoy wearing this current watch that I have, which is a, a Timex Intelligence Quartz flyback chronograph for you out there who are interested. And uh, it's fairly distinctive in that instead of having the little circular um, complications on the dial, it has sort of speedometer style semicircles where the needle will move to the end and then fly back to the beginning. And it does that very intelligently. For instance, when I'm running the stopwatch, 
The stopwatch needle, a dedicated stopwatch needle, will run at fifths of a second increments. And if I were to take a lap time, wherever it'll take into consideration where the stopwatch needle is on the face and account for that extra time of sweep back to zero and factor that into the next lap. Incredibly intelligent. Uh, that's amazing. And I can imagine only a digital hearted watch could handle that sort of complexity. Although having said that, mechanical watches, they can be incredibly complicated as well, as you can imagine. It's, it seems a little unusual that the, the one feature you wanted your watch to have was a stopwatch, and yet you bought an analog watch. Yes, I should have bought a digital watch, really, but I just couldn't find any that weren't horrific to my eyes. They're all very ugly. I don't like the hybrid watches that uh, have a, a sort of an analog face with a little digital um, inserts. Uh, In my day, they were called Annie Digis. Well, Annie Digis, yeah, there you go. So it's, it has an analog, uh, it has uh, arms to tell the time with, and then it will have a, when I say arms, I mean hands, of course, and then it'll have uh, little windows with uh, di- digital um, liquid crystal screens. And I just find them all very ugly. They all seem to be very too busy. It was very difficult to actually see what was going on, whereas the watch that I have at the moment is very clear. I can see exactly where the needles are, and they're, they're not... Um, it's, not, it's just there isn't 50 million little bits of superfluous text covering the dial, uh, which I like. So anyway, so I'm back on the watch train, but I'm very happy with the one that I have at the moment. However, I have been looking at a new. I, I only ever I should I should say that I only ever buy very cheap watches. I'm, I'm not a person who spends any money at all on, on watches. The cheaper the watch and. Uh, and, and if it fits my purpose, that's great. There is a new watch that has been brought out very recently. I think 2013 it came out, and it's by Swatch, a Swiss watch manufacturer famous for popular, very colorful plastic watches uh, and mostly digital watches. That is to say they have uh, an analog presentation, but they, have, they are quartz watches with a, a digital mechanism. They've bought a new watch, which is a mechanical watch. It's called the System 51. And this is a a true mechanical watch, an automatic mechanical watch. But it is the first mechanical watch ever to be completely built by machines. Um, And it's 110 pounds. So this is totally revolutionary. This is the most revolutionary thing to happen in the world of watches for quite some years, evidently. This new System 51 watch from Swatch. Uh, which is amazing. Most mechanical watches are handmade. <laughs> What's the point? What's the point of it? Well, it just has, you know, it has little um, clear plastic windows on the back where you can see the 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 wheels and uh, you, you can see the escapement and it's a mechanical watch. It's not a digital watch. So you actually have to, you actually have to wind it up. Yeah, I, I think some of them are automatic in that they are self-winding. So they have weights in them that, you know, any little movement winds them. So they're, they're perpetual in that sense. But that, anyway, that's quite interesting. The only downside is they don't seem to have any complications. They don't have, uh, uh, stopwatches or anything. But that's my story. Uh, and I, I certainly, whenever I, I always take a poll whenever I'm on public transport or walking around in a crowd of people to see how many people are actually wearing watches. And I think most people wear watches. I don't think that's controversial at all. Most people. I have worn a watch every day of my life for the last every day of my life. And is it just to tell the time? Yes, it is mostly to tell the time. I mean, I can't deny that maybe there is a a small part of it that is a kind of extension of me because, as I say, it is something that I wear every day. I mean, maybe I didn't actually wear a watch every day because there was a, a short period of time where I tried to not wear a watch. You know, we, we see watches you know, all the time or we see clocks all the time, you know, the corner of our computer screens and on our phones and things like that. So I, I tried to not have a watch, but I just kept looking at my blank wrist. I couldn't seem to get out of that habit. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm such a slave to time. Um, so, yeah, I, I went back. But uh, the watches I typically wear are of a kind of early 80s style. I quite like the simple Casio watches from, like, the early 80s. And now they make them fairly authentically. 
uh, and very sympathetically, but with maybe longer battery lives, I'm not sure. And so the one I have right now just does what I need it to do. It tells the time, has a stopwatch, and it's uh, super simple. But it, but is that is that all it is, or is there lots of static text all over the screen? tiny tiny little words floating all over the place it's pretty clear i mean it tells me the date it tells me 24 hour time so i can turn that thing off so. yeah but there's lots of text all around the bezel it says casio and then it has all these little words and things that, things that say time like you don't know that and that bothers me all of that unnecessary text floating around all I, this this is on every watch that i looked at when i was considering buying a watch they're just crammed full of meaningless text. It's just meaningless. Well, sometimes I forget that my watch is waterproof up to 50 meters, you know, sometimes... Presumably when you're at 49 meters, you're going, hang on, was it 50 meters or is it 100 meters? Should I start turning back now (laughs) or can I descend further? So there are basically three types of watches now. There are still mechanical watches these are watches that you do that have a spring they have a main spring and that's effectively the battery that's the power source to drive the hands and to drive whatever complications there may be on the dial complications as i've said are things like stopwatches or moon phases or anything else that needs to be moved by the main spring there are digital watches these are watches which may or may not have a digital presentation on the face, uh, but they are digital in that they are electronic. There are electronics in the watch, usually forming part of the escapement, as it were. The escapement is the the means with which to regulate the power source into increments. Uh, and then, of course, now uh, we have the smart watch. So this is a, a new entrant. I mean, there, were, there have always been fairly clever watches ever since the digital watches appeared on the scene. You had lots of watches that did various things, watches that played music, watches that you could play music upon, watches that had various features, you know, very usage specific features like um, motion detectors or barometers or, you know, lots of uh, sensors. Uh, but now we're in the age of smart, and uh, as it has been said before, uh, computer software is eating the world, and we're and miniaturization is key. Uh, so we're getting watches that are basically little computers that you wear on your wrist. Uh, so three main types of watches are around these days, and certainly all of them are worn on the wrist. I haven't seen hardly any watches that are pocket watches or go anywhere else in any way. It's definitely wrist-mounted devices. So just to go over some of the technology, because it really is all about technology. I mean, they, they, they serve a principal function, and that is to tell the time. They are timekeeping devices, so they are all about technology, despite the fact that there's so much fashion involved. It really is technology. And that's been just gradually refining and becoming more sophisticated and more featureful uh, as time has gone on. And the sorts of things that we have now, uh, the main technological areas that uh, are constantly under innovative pressure, are the power source. So power is always a problem. Nobody wants to wind up a watch every day. Uh, And certainly when wristwatches first appeared, you'd lose 10, 20 minutes in a day. And you'd certainly have to wind them up and adjust the time. Uh, having to adjust the time regularly has, is no longer required for most watches. Uh, and the efficiency of the mainsprings in modern mechanical watches is amazing. Uh, so much so that a typical mainspring is so sprung that if it were to, exp- if it were to fall out of its barrel that, that keeps the tension, it would literally explode. This is a metal coiled spring that is literally dangerous. It's under so much uh, tension. Uh, and the batteries in digital watches last years, I think, li- literally <laughs> years. My, my, the, the battery in my watch, I think, is good for five years. So five years continuous use, usage. And it has a, a backlit dial. So I can press a button and the whole dial lights up. So I don't know 
you know, if I use that two or three times a day, I don't know what effect that would have on the battery in terms of years. But uh, I've had it for a long time, but I don't know. I haven't even thought to think about what the battery life is like. Um, we have fitness devices. So um, fitness is a big thing, a new technology in wrist-mounted watches. Um, and uh, they were really popular a couple of years ago, but I think they're slightly less popular now. I think they're a bit gimmicky and people don't really need to know, you know, whether or not they've achieved 100% of their fitness goals on their wristwatch. Uh, and alarms. That's another technology, which I always thought was the most useful technology for watches. Uh, having a watch that beeps to wake you up or whatever it is, and it's on your wrist. I think that's, I still think that's fantastic. <laughs> that still amazes me. You know, just being able to set an alarm on your wristwatch and it just beeps and you're reminded. That's just genius. That's that's one of the, the key. And, and the mechanical alarms were even more amazing. Hearing the little tiny little bell inside a mechanical watch as an alarm, that's incredible. And I think, you know, only the very expensive mechanical watches have such things. But uh, the technology is astounding. I mean, whenever you look at the big brands, they're all about technology and they're all about, I mean, if you've seen any advertisements for all of the premium brands of wristwatches, they'll tell you about their custom escapements. They'll tell you about the jewels they use. And the jewels are typically little gems that are a pivot point for the wheels. So there are lots of cogs in a mechanical watch, and the pinions of the cogs sit inside little bowl-shaped or donut-shaped gemstones, like synthetic rubies, just so they get the smallest amount of resistance and the the greatest possible durability. So that's the jewels in a watch. And whenever you look at the advertisements for the premium brands, they show you exploded computer graphic diagrams of the inner workings of these amazing tiny little contraptions, which are all are all mostly handmade still. So that's amazing as well. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy that there's still such a market for clockwork watches. Well, I think it's amazing how labor intensive it is. I mean, you, you need a lot of skill, a lot of training and a lot of time. To, to build these watches. I mean, it's just no surprise whenever you look in a jewelry store, you know, uh, with uh, premium brand watches in it, you know, the price tags on these watches are just, you know, astronomical. And you think, wow, sure, you know, surely it's not that expensive. But when, when you think about what goes into it, it is, it is pretty amazing. You know, it's not just that. It's also all of the precious materials and the, the conflict minerals and all the rest of it that, make these watches so ludicrously expensive and that people want to buy them rather than save a starving child. <laughs> Indeed. But uh, they, they are just such achievements, these watches. And of course, there's the, the, the status element and the aesthetics and all that, obviously. Well, people buy these expensive watches because they want to boast about how much money they've earned and they, they want to show off about just how many children they've inadvertently killed by withholding food from their mouths. Well, that's not necessarily true because some watches, you know, it, it, people who really do want an excellent watch that works really well and is really, really super reliable and dependable are willing, you know, are perhaps the type of people who are willing to spend a little bit more for a watch that will give them that. So they really are after the performance. And then there are others who inherit, inherit watches. So, of course, there's Patek Philippe, um, a seriously premium brand manufacturer, uh, and they, they say in their advertising, begin your own tradition. You know, you never really own a Patek Philippe. You just, you're a, a custodian until the next generation. See, this watch, 30 pounds. It costs 30 pounds. It tells perfect time. It never breaks down. And people can see just how cool I am. Mm. Um, I had a look at the, I was just thinking what the biggest brands are. And I heard somewhere that there are only really 20 or so, or even fewer than 20 brands that hold their value um, by and large of the thousands and thousands of watch manufacturers out there you know they're as good as they last and they're not they don't continue value and they certainly don't gain value as time goes by there are about 20 that really do and just going down the most famous and the most premium brands of watches I just picked out about 
15 or so. In alphabetical order, we have Apple, and their slogan is currently you at a glance, uh, which I quite like because these are smartwatches that can give you notifications and they can tell you about all of your social media. So as you are defined by your social media, so that is, you know, completely apt, you at a glance. There's, I'm going to butcher this uh, name, Audemars Peugeot, Puget, Audemars Puget, AP. Uh, I think they, their watches start at insane amounts of money. Uh, to break the rules, you must first master them, is their slogan. Breitling, of course, which is favored by um, aviator types. Instruments for professionals. Nice slogan there. Uh, there's Cartier, uh, the jeweler of kings, evidently. Casio, technology for life. Uh, Casio is a massive brand. I think they probably manufacture more watches than all the uh, other manufacturers put together, probably. Um, IWC Schaffhausen, IWC watches. I saw an IWC watch once, uh, and I, ne- I never saw another one again. <laughs> I think I've only ever seen one in my life. Uh, but again, a major premium brand, uh, and their their slogan was at least since 1868 and for as long as there are men. I'm quite sure what they uh, they mean by that. There's Jeger Le Cult. Jeger Le Kurt. Um, have you ever worn a real watch? Was once one of their slogans. Uh, thousands and thousands and twenty, you know, up to a hundred thousand pounds of their watches. I think if you were to buy a new one. There's Omega, of course. Uh, significant moments. Another huge brand. Patek Philippe. These are the ones where they think you know when you buy it, you buy it for the next generation. You should really just keep it in a box. Uh, Rolex, of course, um, it, very popular in the 80s. A crown for every achievement. There's Swatch, fashion that ticks. So this is a very mainstream, relatively low-cost, disposable-looking plastic watch line. Uh, there is Tag, uh, don't crack under pressure. A uh, very popular watch brand that I think was made most famous by a American movie star, I think. He was famous for a car chase in one of his films. His name escapes me. I think he made it famous. Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen. That's the one. And then Timex. Life is ticking. I've always been a fan of Timex. I think they have just a little bit of a better understanding about form versus function. I think they get the balance uh, right a lot of the time. Uh, but of course, uh, fashion comes into it. And fashion is, is very funny because costs and prices have no relative value when it comes to fashion. I mean, fashion, it, it, the price doesn't matter. It's fashion. So I think it's probably a good idea to, to connect your brand with fashion if you can and whatever your brand is. If you can get any kind of fashion angle on it, then you can charge incredible sums of money because people are willing to spend incredible amounts of money for fashion. And I think what Apple is doing with their watches, they're trying to do that. And I think that's a very good idea. So they've currently or recently allied themselves with Hermes, a uh, top fashion brand. And I think they have a couple of um, Hermes uh, bands, which I think they sell for a few hundred pounds, probably. But uh, connect yourself with fashion. And certainly all of these premium brands have done exactly that. You know, any glossy magazine, open up the glossy magazine and there will be a film star or a sports personality wearing whatever the watch is. Well, they can afford the watches, but the watch companies just give them to them for free. And they never wear watches normally. And they're just given these watches. <laughs> Please, please be seen with my watch. Thank you very much. And uh, and it's still very popular. I mean, you know, advertising watches is a, a big business. I was watching the latest James Bond movie a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he's very, very conspicuously wearing a few different watches. Not just one. There's definitely a couple of different watches, and no doubt they are going to be, you know, Patek Philippe or, or, or whatever it is, many thousands Omega. of pounds. Or, or Omega, Omega indeed. I think they, I think that's a very popular Bond watch, if I'm not mistaken, Omega. I think it's 
definitely done the rounds. But advertising, it's uh, it's amazing. I, I would love to know. I couldn't find the figures on the advertising for watches, but it must be vast. I think the vast amount of invested money for any watch manufacturer must be advertising because I see watch advertisements everywhere, just absolutely everywhere, mostly in glossy magazines, but, you know, elsewhere they seem to follow me around. And I don't just mean by cookies on websites. But the actual uh, terminology of watches. So I looked into this a little bit because I think it's quite interesting. It's such a big universe. Watch collecting and watch aficionados. I mean, it's it's big. You know, it's hundreds of years big. Uh, so there's jargon and there's, you know, there's so much to learn. But I just wanted to know what the very basics of watches was. I mean, what, what, what is the anatomy of a watch? You know, we're used to looking at watches and we know that they have hands and we know that they have second hands. Uh, but what is all the other stuff? What's, what, what are the names for all these various things? <clears throat> and so in our notes, there's a little diagram. Uh, but, you know, you have a, a band. The band connects to a shoulder. There's the hands on the face. Uh, it's a case. Uh, the numbers or dots for the hours are called markers. The face of the watch is a dial. The glass over the watch, or, or, or crystal, is the lens. You have the, the crown, which is always very popular. and It's typically used to adjust the hands to the correct time. Uh, usually it has different depths where you can adjust other things, like if there's a calendar, for instance, or uh, if there's a, a stopwatch or something or other. And then you have buttons on a lot of watches. It's very popular to have a crown with two buttons either side for a stopwatch. So, you know, most watches you'll see with a stopwatch will have the buttons, you know, both on the right-hand side of the watch because all watches are racist and hate left-handed people. So they're all on one side only. I'm glad you think lefties are a different race. I don't think that. I know that. <laughs> Do you remember that there was a certain style of watch that became very popular based on this Rolex watch? In fact, the Rolex watch I'm thinking of... Is like a diver's watch. The, the Seamaster. Is it called the Seamaster? Yeah. It's a very kind of iconic look where you kind of have around the circumference of the uh, watch face, you have numbers. I'm sorry, maybe not Seamaster. I beg your pardon. I think it's the Submariner. Yeah, I think the Seamaster is the Omega. Okay, the Submariner. But it has this bezel, which you can then rotate. Yes. And I'm just going to guess that that it's maybe about 100% of the people who bought those watches never used it or never even knew what it was? Well, I think there are two features there. There's ones that just allow you to time things by moving just a number dial around. Just by using the hands, uh, you know, the, the normal hands, you could then time things if you move the time frame around with a little rotating disc or bezel. And then there's the tachometer. The tachometer is something which most people don't understand and is on a lot of sporty style watches. And cars. Yeah, and so it's just it's literally just a bunch of numbers that don't seem to make any sense that run around the outside of the watch or even on the on the upper side of the outside of the watch, you know, actually on the outside of the case and not on the inside dial. And usually it starts as you know, it's, it's a number that goes from the top and it starts from something like 650 and then it goes all the way down around to 60. Uh, what is the tachometer? So I can tell you what the tachometer is. And it's actually really useful. It's just a means by which you can work out how long or how many times anything can take in an hour. So for instance, if I'm timing a train going by and I time it going by for, you know, six seconds, I can look at my tachometer and see what number is lined up with six seconds. And it'll tell me how many times the exact same thing can happen on average over an hour. So if it were six seconds, it'd be something like 650 times in an hour, whatever it was. So if I time something and it could, takes 15 seconds, I can look at my tachometer and say, wow, if it, maintained the same current speed, it would have done it 240 times in an hour. It's just one of the ways in which you can use a tachometer. So it is useful. It's usually used for calculating speed, but it can be used for calculating 
how long it takes, you know, how, how many times you can do anything in, in, in an hour. It's interesting, but totally not essential. I don't think for anybody who's, <laughs> you know, I have one on my watch and I, I've never used it. You have it on your watch. And I'd rather it wasn't there. I do. I'd, I'd rather can you hold it up. I'd, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather it didn't, it didn't have it. Right. You, see, you, you were just railing there about watches being really busy, and I've never seen a busier watch than yours. No, but my watch, every everything has a, a reason. It, it, it's, it's, it has a lot of functions on it. It has uh, a stopwatch. It has uh, the date. It has um, dual time, uh, time zones. You know, it actually has a lot of functions on it. So there's no getting away from the busyness. But it's when you have it's when you have superfluous. Uh, Jeff, that's not what I was talking about. No, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the bezel that you can physically rotate, and it has numbers on it. Yeah, that that I think just allows you to. It's just a timer. Okay, I'm just putting this up on the screen now. I'll put this in the show notes. But that's. I mean, you're looking at a the Submariner, uh, which is a diving watch. So that's for divers. You know, it's really important that they <laughs> make sure that they they budget their their oxygen or whatever it is. So it's a timer. So, so how does that work? D- does it turn itself? No, no. You, you dive into the water at whatever time, you know, 20 past the hour, and then you move the little dial to give you 10 minutes or to give you 30 minutes, and then you can see exactly how long you've been submerged or whatever uh, it is. For a watch that costs $10,000, you think something as important as that would be automated? Yeah, some things are, are you know, I mean, the things that really get me with uh, mechanical watches are things like the date. I mean, how on earth? I just, I, I just, I don't understand it. Now, I'm looking at this picture that you sent me, which unfortunately, listeners, you will have to check the notes to have a look at, but it's the Submariner. This is a Rolex, and it has, says on the front, Oyster Perpetual Date. So, this perpetual word, sometimes you'll see perpetual, sometimes you'll see annual, um, and what that means is it has a calendar built into the watch. So a perpetual, an annual calendar is a calendar that knows how many days there are in every month of the year. And you would have to adjust it at the end of the year um, or, or March the 1st. And then you have a, a perpetual calendar or a watch that just says perpetual on it. And what that means is that the calendar in the mechanical watch accounts for leap years as well. So this is a watch that you only need to adjust every 100 years or so. It actually rolls the date on the watch forward two days if it's a leap year. So, I mean, and then that's all mechanically done. So that's completely crazy. Um, And all of this added complexity to have a perpetual calendar on your watch you know one that has the day that tells you what day it is and tells you the date and it accounts for leap years i mean clearly that's going to account for the uh, you know a vast part of the cost which is going to be colossal for such an an amazing achievement Uh, and there are there are lots of other um functions that are similar to moon moon phases as well can get really quite complicated but, uh, you know, the, these things account for the incredible prices. Okay, I've just sent you the Rolex GMT Master 2. So it's another, um, to my eyes, very um, bulbous-looking Rolex with that uh, lens over the uh, date. Uh, so you can see the date on your wristwatch from the other side of the room. <laughs> so does that make any sense? You look at the numbers uh, around the bezel. Um, okay, so the picture that Ben has just sent me, if I describe it to you, ha- there is a Rolex that has a movable bezel, and on the bezel it simply has um, a 24-hour period. So that might tell you, 24 hour time i suppose but you but you can move it so maybe it's it's dual time i can definitely uh f- I, I suppose i can imagine utility for that but i don't know specifically what it's for yeah it looks pretty incomprehensible there there is such a thing as an analog 24 hour watch it's really neat when it's a what would be six o'clock on a normal watch face it's actually 12 noon it takes 24 hours for the hour hand to do one full revolution of the clock face yeah there's a watch manufacturer called slow 
and they make a watch which has 24 hours on the face and it only has one hand. So the idea is, you know, if the watch, if the single hand is pointing straight up, it's 6 p.m. If it's pointing straight down, it's midnight. Yeah, it's called slow because it takes so long to figure out what the time is. Yeah, it's very difficult to work accurately what the time is. I mean, it can be done, but it, so you have to squint a bit. You need a pen and paper. Uh, well, no, it's just that it's not going to be that accurate because it's cramming in 24 hours. And, and I, I get it. I mean, it's slow because, look, you don't really need to know to the minute. Um, and there's no second hand, and uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, it, it appealed to me there for a, a few minutes, but there is no stopwatch, so I'm not interested. But there are lots of different ways. I mean, there are a million watches that have a novel way of presenting the time. I've seen binary watches. Uh, I've seen watches that use um, sort of hands that roll instead of sweep. And, uh, you know, I mean, every possible kind of novelty is available on wristwatches. You know, it's completely crazy. And that's ranging from insane functionality to ridiculous materials, like completely encrusted in diamonds, uh, to just um, to uh, the presentations of the time that you simply have to decipher. Like, you know, it's a puzzle. <laughs> So you have to spend five minutes gazing into your watch to try and work out what time it is because it's so complicated. So, I mean, you know, that's that's on the extremes of uh, of watch wearing as far as I'm concerned. Usually I think people want reliability. Uh, they want some, you know, visual... They, they want it to be visually pleasing. I mean, it is jewelry, uh, and you want your watch to be nice. I mean, there's a, it's very tactile. It's very physical. You really are wearing it all the time. So to have a nice clasp, to, to have a nice... Band, you know, to, to, if it if it looks good, it looks good. It just comes, you know, for me, it's part of my ritual of you know getting up in the morning. I, I put my clothes on, I put my watch on. Uh, you know, it's it's dress. It's part of getting dressed for me now, which is amazing because you know, a few years ago, I would have you know thought you're mad. I, I have a I have a phone, but the, the the change is again the convenience. The convenience of having a stopwatch on my wrist, and the convenience of being able to tell the time. Because sometimes I'm cycling, and I, I I cannot get my phone out of my pocket to see what the time is. Whereas I'm you know my watch is is always on. I was having a conversation with a colleague uh, just last week who has an Apple Watch, and he finds it amazingly frustrating cycling with the apple watch because it, he can't it doesn't tell him the time it's off he has to let go of the handlebars <laughs> in order for the time to appear uh, even though he can see the watch clearly when he has it on the handlebars it's off uh, and he finds that incredibly frustrating he should get a normal watch for cycling yeah so the the apple watch is not even good at telling the time so you know, i wonder what the the appeal is if there is any but uh, moving into smartwatches, uh, I certainly see more and more and more of them. And I, I, they do appeal. I like the idea of seeing a text message on your wrist, you know, as it comes in. So you don't have to fish into your pocket for your mobile phone. You can see what it is and whether or not it's important, whether or not you can ignore it. Uh, so I think there's definitely utility there. And all the sensors and, you know, the heart rate monitors and all that sort of thing, you know. As if we're not paranoid enough about our health, I think it's great to have a, a little wrist-mounted nag uh, that just, you know, chirps um, enthusiastically about how poorly you're doing health-wise. I think that's great. So we've covered perpetual, that mystery, uh, tachometers. Oh, quartz. Quartz is something we haven't discussed. So we always hear about quartz watches and how, you know, it was always a big thing. I mean, when I was a kid, that was the biggest bit of superfluous text on the front of a digital watch. Quartz. And what that means is that just like Galileo, when he observed the regularity of a pendulum and how, you know, it's all about the length of the pendulum uh, when it comes to the period, um, it's all about regular intervals, and it's all about the period. So what quartz is, is it's a little bit of crystal. It's super common. I mean, it's a grain of sand, basically. So, you know, it's one of the most common compounds on the planet. But it's a piezoelectric compound. Piezo. And what that means, it could be piezo, piezo, I've heard both. 
Uh, and what it what it what that actually means is if you squeeze a little quartz crystals, you can shape them. You can cut them into different shapes, and the type of shape that you cut them into can determine the number of vibrations and you know per second. But the point is, is that a little vibrating quartz crystal that's fed a tiny little drop of electricity creates an amazingly accurate timekeeping mechanism, which gets around problems like magnetic interference and gravity. Uh, so it's just vastly superior in terms of just plain old timekeeping than any other technology. Um, and that's what quartz watches are. So if you really do want to keep excellent time, then uh, you really want to go for quartz. So all of these mechanical watches, no matter how well they're engineered, uh, uh, your Casio quartz watch, you could argue, is more accurate. So that was a bit of a slap in the face for the uh, mechanical watch industry. But of course, it's never going to go away because of the aesthetics and because of the build quality. And people want to know that people have slaved over something that they wear on their wrist. Uh, because, it's, it's, because it's interesting, you know. It's amazing to think that they're little cogs and wheels. Not quite slaved. I mean, people in Switzerland are probably working in pretty good conditions. Yeah, well, when I say slave, I mean, you know, it's really it's really hard. Yeah, it's really hard to make these watches. I mean, so it's, it's a lot of effort. You really do have to uh, risk your life packing in those mainsprings uh, when building a, a, a top watch. So uh, we've discussed what jewels are. Um, we know what horology is. The escapement, this is just a mechanism that helps regulate the uh, consistent periods in a mechanical watch. Um, the crystal is, when we say crystal, we're either referring to the quartz crystal, the little microscopic uh, crystal of quartz in a quartz watch, or we're talking about the sort of glass that you protect the dial with on the top of the watch. So usually this is glass. It can be plastic. It can be sort of a, a refined crystalline gra glass, or it could be sapphire crystal, I think is probably the best protective lens on a watch that you can get. It's the most uh, scratch resistant, I believe. Although I've had a sapphire crystal watch once it must not have been a very good type of sapphire crystal because only a couple of weeks after having worn it i managed to scratch it in some somehow i can't remember how but i did um we've we've not spoken about chronometers so another thing that you always see and i'm looking still looking at this uh, photograph of the rolex oyster perpetual uh that you sent me and on it, it says superlative chronometer. And then it says officially certified. So what a chronometer means, it's, it's marketing puff. And it just means that it's accurate to within a certain tolerance as determined by a Swiss official department of time keeping. So if it's plus or minus four seconds a day, you can call yourself a chronometer. If you're plus or minus, you know, vastly less than that, you can get away with calling yourself a, a superlative chronometer. Uh, that's all it means. So a chronometer just means it's very accurate. Uh, and it's something that you only get if you're a mechanical watch manufacturer. Uh, you can't call a Casio a superlative chronometer because although it is, it has. It wasn't certified by the uh, the Swiss. Um, uh, complications we've discussed. These are various features that appear on the faces of watches, uh, mostly mechanical watches like date and stopwatches, and uh, and very rarely timers. I very I wanted a timer, but I couldn't find any at all out there. They don't seem to do them. But it would be great if you had a, a analog countdown timer. On a watch, that would be incredible. I've never seen one. Uh, so that's the world of watches. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I think it's going to get more interesting, especially with smart watches. I think obviously they've only just appeared, and they seem very unpopular, f from as far as I can tell. I can see lots of people not wearing them anymore. When I know, I know they did originally. Uh, but I think 
we will all get one maybe in the next 10 years because there'll be, I, I think computer technology will just disappear, will definitely just go away. Computer keyboards and big boxes and they'll just vanish. Computer mice, all of it will just go. And computers will be invisible. And I think if if there's any manifestation of computer technology left, it will be some kind of wearable device. And I'm betting it'll be some kind of wristwatch. That will be all of your computers or the way in which you communicate with your computer or the way in which you communicate with some sort of, you know, huge central computing facility. But it will be watching you. It'll be listening to you all the time. It'll be filming everything around it. It'll, it'll be doing the whole, the whole bit. So it'll either be a necklace or it'll be a wristwatch. Now I'm betting it'll be a wristwatch. So I think smartwatches aren't going away. Uh, it'll be a while before they become really popular, but I think they're here to stay. And I can completely see that original Hamilton Pulsar coming back, uh, looking the same, but, but actually it's a supercomputer on your, on your wrist. It's going to happen. <coughs> and in the, in the same vein, I think, um, mechanical watches are never going to go away. They'll always be around because they're handmade. They're handmade by humans. And I, I was, I was quite surprised when I read that Swatch was the first manufacturer who actually made a mechanical watch that was completely built by robots. Uh, and that was in 2013. So incredible. Just sh- goes to show that they're, they're really complicated. They're just so incredibly complicated that we still, we still, still can't make them with machines. So, you know, maybe it's a good idea to invest in a Patek Philippe or an IWC, always gaining in value. Maybe that's what hedge funds do. Maybe they just buy a whole shipload of anything that they know will uh, gain in value. I put a list of watches in the show notes here. Some interesting ones. Uh, Obama's watch. He wears a, a Jorg Grey model 6500, uh, and he loves it. And it's a very attractive watch. I have to say, I was surprised. But instead of having my beautiful hemi hemi circle um, complications, it has the usual spherical complications with the stopwatches and calendars. There's the Omega Speedmaster. So that was the the first and only watch to make it to the moon that was worn on the moon. 1962, uh, and it worked on the moon. Um, I have a picture of the Chopard 210 carat watch. This is the most expensive watch, new watch in the world. It's 18 million pounds. And uh, it, it looks as though there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little watch buried in a bracelet of ju- jewels and diamonds. It's, it, it is horrific. Uh, but it's glittery. I have a picture of Joe, James Bond's watch, Inspector. I didn't see this one. I think he wore a few during that film. But this is an Omega Seamaster Aqua Terra James Bond Spectre Edition watch. Uh, a snip at £4,650. That's a very handsome looking watch. And also there's a, a, a Parmigiani. This is a watch manufacturer who have made the Bugatti 370 model. And it's just a steampunk reminiscent, just crazy cylinder of metal and glass on your wrist that makes no sense at all. I have no idea. It doesn't look like a traditional watch in any way. And I have no clue how you might tell the time on it, but it's a really out there sort of uh, art piece that you put on your wrist. And uh, I think that's about it. I don't think I learned anything more about the world of watches. I'm, I'm a happy watch wearer now. Uh, I'm not thinking about the next watch I might get, nor am I any kind of collector. I, can't, I mean, I, I have collected watches in that there are watches in my drawer that I no longer wear. Uh, but uh, I think it's one of those things that's so complicated. I wouldn't know where to begin with collecting watches. I have absolutely no idea. I mean, there are hundreds of shops I walk by which have loads of old watches in the window. But I have a feeling that they're all fairly worthless. Even, you know, they're, they might be 50 years old. I think they're, they're not worth anything at all. I think it's, 
it's these French and Swiss brands. They're the ones that you want to look out for. And anything else is just a waste of time. Well, unless there's anything else, uh, I'd just like to remind listeners that you've been listening to Eclecticist, uh, the podcast. We talk about anything. Uh, we do this because we want to learn a little bit about things and hopefully uh, have a little discussion out there in listener land. Uh, you can find information on all of our past shows and you can leave some uh, comments uh, on our webpage at eclecticist.co.uk. Uh, we don't know what we're going to be talking about next week, but uh, if you have any ideas, send along a suggestion. Uh, we'll put up details on the website. Our outro music of choice this week is, again, very open source so we don't get sued. It's Devil's Wristwatch by Eaters. This is licensed under an attribution non-commercial share alike 3.0 license. And it's the United States version. It's uh, very hip hoppy, but uh, very high production values. It's very crystal clear sounding to my ears. Um, please enjoy it. And until next time, good evening. I always wanted to be a rapper when I was younger Practice with my pen until my writing became stronger Accidentally adding accents to demeaning feelings Open in my brain with rusty knives to fill my evenings Interested in anything twisted I turned and twined my words until the last They became ballistic, real life is so constricting I grew old, grew more sophisticated in my taste for escapism The impending friction between off his life A thoughtful purpose left an anger upon me Black lightning flashed across my backbone Turning pacifist to ashes and anger into energy And I could write it Building bigger bombs to fill my armory And now I stand with godlike template breakers Musical freaks and oddities Unusual deformities in my anarchist minor Consider me the Shakespearean fool Village idiots are grand and I'm discharged from this existence Hip-hop is a parasite which hates its host and makes me hostile I suck culture through my protruding needle and proboscis I smell the stink of stagnation Veronimus bottom of difficulty envisaging these disfigured inners But I'll not spill my guts before you Rather be words that are something wonderful And end up angry cause it's easy Call me laughing gear Something put into the eaters The future world leaders The imagination industry the standard the sound of efficiency The symbol of an impending force Pulled in pillars Nurtured on aggression and chaos Embrace it by them Accept the introduction Induct your brain and sustain Design. I've just been biding my time, but in the back of my mind I heard my conscience call, it said that time doesn't sleep Time holds no retreat, so I put on my game face And I was ready to eat, I strapped on my wristwatch Cause it was starting to tick, it always feels good When everything just clicks, like a monument of power I was ready for war, ready to wipe those suckers all over the floor I'm a mechanic home menace, but I like who I am I get up every morning and I know that I can I'm like a pendulum swinging, I won't stop till I'm stopped I'm with my devil's wrist, watch I know I'm down with the clock I got time on my side, till there's no need to hide I'm like a juggernaut in motion when the rhythm's inside So if you see me coming, just get down and pray